So I began to think about how do the two mix and how do the two mingle. And then I began to realize that really part of what Creative Commons is all about is it's kind of the way that people view uh, media nowadays, at least the younger generation. Uh, the things and the essences of the very nature of Creative Commons is the way that people want to interact with their media. So we're going to talk a little bit about digital distribution, and then we're going to get into the devices, and then we'll look at the actual ways that Creative Commons works and why it works the way that it does. Very brief introduction, Creative Commons is basically a way to permissively give rights about copyright instead of restricting rights. So, a brief history of digital distribution. Does anyone here know what is on my screen? Can anyone see it? <laughs> it's small, I know, but, uh, I'm sorry? Metadata sheet. sheet, possibly. This is what I grew up with in college. This was my best friend in college, perhaps. This is Napster. Uh, Napster uh, was, you all know the name Napster. Here's the amazing thing about Napster. It's had a huge impact on our culture, but it was only actually in existence as the file sharing form you see there for two years. It was in 1999, and then in 2001 they killed it because of legal issues, right? Okay. So the, Napster is for me one of the major focal points for digital distribution because it's when it became popular. It's when people suddenly had access to materials that maybe they shouldn't have. Uh, and maybe it began us thinking about the legal ramifications of files on the internet. Do we know what this is? iTunes. Excellent. iTunes has been around since 2001 for Macintosh computers. Uh, and then 2000, 2003, it was introduced for Windows. And then there's another big thing that happened in 2003 for iTunes. That's when the music store came out. So for the first two years of iTunes, all it was was a way to catalog your audio files. You had to take CDs and rip them and put them on your hard drive. But then in 2003, that's when you could start downloading them. What happened in October of 2005? Apple introduced the video store. Okay? So this changes digital distribution again. 2005 is when we get to the point that broadband has come out in the United States big enough for a major company to say, you can download movies. You can download TV shows. These are big files, but they get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, for me, I'm so used to downloading stuff. Um, recently, uh, Amazon had a sale on House MD, um, the TV show. Seasons 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5. Or, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Going right now. Um, they had them on sale for, get this, the entire season for $5. Okay. Digital distribution changes everything, including the cost. Because really what Amazon was doing was they were making it a loss leader. They were taking a loss to do marketing for their download store. Obviously, Amazon is not making a whole lot of money off of $5. In fact, uh, one of the ways that Amazon has in their agreements is if you were to put something on the Kindle, which we'll talk about later, uh, the, the publisher only gets a certain percentage of the original retail price, okay? But Amazon can charge whatever they want. They can put it on sale whenever and however they want. So maybe you tell Amazon, hey, I want to sell this book for $30. Amazon says that that's great. You're gonna get 35% of that. But then they decide that they're gonna charge, sell it for $2 because it's on sale. You still get your 35% of $20, but they take a loss. So, uh, as of June 2008, let's take a guess. How many songs have been sold through iTunes? Anyone want to be bold and throw a million? A billion. Millions? One billion? Let's try five billion. Okay? That's a lot of songs. Okay? Do we possibly think that for the music industry, iTunes is now a viable form of distribution. <laughs> yeah. All right. Me. Um, it, what's interesting is, you know, the music industry, because of iTunes, however, is slightly hurting because the music industry is built upon album sales. Mm -hmm. iTunes is based upon 
track zones. So what we're actually seeing happen in iTunes is a lot of people are doing exclusive content that might be uh, just a four song EP that was live or something like that and it shows up on iTunes because they're trying to get those additional sales out of those songs and people will buy it that way. People are becoming super fans of items or super fans of bands and they want to acquire everything they can. If the only way to get it through iTunes, they'll do so. This is the chart on sales of iTunes for digital distribution. This chart only spans a couple of years, right? Okay. This uh, began in 2003 and we're in 2008 and we see that uh, the fifth billion song only took 157 days after the fourth billion. This is an exponential curve here, okay? So the publishing industry, the print industry, maybe we haven't quite figured, figured it out yet. But when we do figure it out, when someone figures it out, maybe Amazon figured it out with the Kindle. I don't know. When someone figures out the digital distribution for publishing, it's going to do this. We've got to be ready for it. We have to know what's out there. Does anyone know what this is? Chrome and Hulu. Great. Chrome. Chrome is the web browser. Uh, Chrome. Uh, who here knows what Chrome is? Excellent. We should all know what Chrome is. Chrome is the Google browser. Okay. Chrome is uh, uh, rapidly gaining in popularity um, and also rapidly decreasing in popularity. Um, it's, it's been an interesting spike in, in, in how people used it. For the first couple of days, tons of people were growing using Google's new browser. And then people just kind of drifted off because they're going back to what they're familiar with or they just don't think to open a Chrome. You know? What that shows us is that the tech audience is more than willing to try things out now. We are more than willing to be experimental. Um, we're very open to it. And uh, we like free stuff. Uh, Hulu, who knows what Hulu is? Okay. Hulu is owned by NBC and Fox. And they actually have many other uh, networks working with them. It launched this year. Hulu, you can go onto Hulu.com and stream in pretty high quality TV shows, movies, SNL skits for free. Why would they do this? Why would you give away something free that is their bread and butter? I don't know. That's part of what they're doing. Digital media and digital distribution of this nature is becoming more or less a marketing technique, right? They're not making a whole lot of money off of Hulu. Go ahead. Do they not include advertisements? There is ads. There's, uh, and it's typically, it's like at the end. Right? So you watch the whole thing and then there's an ad. Now there's ads actually spaced throughout, but it's usually one uh, specific mm -hmm. company or company that they're advertising to. Mm -hmm. It is spaced throughout. Okay. Okay. It, it depends on which one you're watching. There are, uh, there are some that that I've seen, like the, like the SNL skits, right? That's what I watch mostly on here. Um, those are, at the end, there's no commercial break. But if you're watching a regular TV show, they uh, put like one ad in there. And so, right? I, I mean, I'm noticing, see the same thing on their site, they're watching the full episodes. Mm -hmm. The thing that cracks me up is they're trying to get the consumer to interact with the app. And the last thing the consumer wants to do is actually even watch the app, let alone interact with it. So, um, you know, one thing I do appreciate about them is they, I think they don't want to give it over to YouTube. Mm. I think they want to capture what they can and not let YouTube take control of, of bits and pieces of their property. You're entirely correct. Uh, the actual Hulu initiative actually was started in 2007, and it was started because they realized YouTube owns media online, and they couldn't control it. Um, Thankfully, you know, now there's ways for uh, a company to go in and tell YouTube, aka Google, uh, hey, you've got our media, it's copyrighted, pull it down, and they will. Um, some people take advantage of that, some don't, you know. Um, interestingly enough, uh, most music studios have leveraged YouTube, and they give YouTube their music videos to put on there right away. And that way, YouTube has a high-quality version of the music video, 
and then they'll brand it, you know, this is an official EMI um, YouTube video or whatnot, and it becomes marketing for them. Okay? So this is the brief history of digital, digital distribution that I wanted to look at. Because we saw way back there that we had Napster, and it was um, rebellious, you know, down with the man. You know, I'm getting stuff for free. These rich people, I don't even pay them anymore. I just get the content I want, and it's cool. And then that got killed. Uh, and then Apple came out with being the distributor, the warehouse, and saying, this is, uh, this is the best way for you to get your content. Uh, the original iTunes store was a means to an end to sell iPods, right? So the only way you could get music off of iTunes was if you had an iPod. So since it was the best store, people would buy an iPod so they could go to this catalog of tons of songs. Now uh, you can purchase what's called iTunes Plus tracks, and those are DRM-free songs. And if you have a DRM-free song, you can put it on any device. You don't have to put it on an iPod. So we see that change happening. Then we see this change over to Hulu. So we had this warehouse publisher of iTunes, and now we see that the actual content creators, Hulu, which is owned by NBC and Fox, are putting out their media. So as the technology gets easier to work with, as the pioneers like Apple, um, as we catch up to them, the publishers are taking back control over the content that's out there. Currently, I would suggest that the best digital distribution service for ebooks would be the Kindle. Um, and I think the Kindle is going to be the de facto uh, reader because of the way that they do distribution. Um, in the earlier conference, uh, they, they mentioned that the Sony e-reader, no one really knows what to do with it. Well, it's because they don't know how to get content to it. You know, With the Kindle, I can turn it on and I can download a book from the beach because it has a cell phone connection in it. So I go to Amazon store on the Kindle and I get whatever, song, whatever, whatever book I want. That's equivalent to the iTunes model. So I would encourage you all to take notice of the fact that eventually what happened was Hulu came out in the video market, right? So at some point, you guys will take back over distribution. And whether it's a consortium of different publishers, it has a website that delivers things, I think that the de facto reader will be the Kindle, but at some point, you guys are going to be the ones controlling the digital channels. A Kindle is this device, and we'll look at this in about five minutes. So what do you all have uh, on your tables there that I, I handed out before uh, the presentation? We have a magazine, right? Okay. So this is a Collide magazine. It's a magazine I like for if you... Uh, if you notice, there's an article in there about rural technology. I'm not sure who wrote it, but it's a pretty good article. Uh, this is one of the primary ways that lots and lots of people uh, get information, right? Uh, how many of you all here have subscribed to a magazine before? Okay, all right. So you would think that magazines are a valid form of getting information, right? I subscribe to 400 magazines. I subscribe to 400 RSS feeds. What this means is a website pushes their content to me on my computer. Right? Okay? So the computer maybe in some ways replaces the magazine or even the book. Right? I'm not so sure about the book yet because the book you sit down and you read for a long time. But magazine is typically short articles that you can read here and there or in the bathroom in about five minutes, right? So blogs and websites and whatnot have taken over this way of delivering short form content. Um, now what about websites? Okay, I have a picture on here particularly. Uh, this is a netbook. Uh, have you guys heard the term netbook before? Yes? No. Okay. Uh, a netbook is basically a really cheap and underpowered laptop. Okay, uh, the netbook that I'm showing right there is the Dell Mini One Two Three. 
you can go to Dell.com and purchase that netbook for about $400. Um, if you go to Toys R Us, oh, there's a netbook in the back. 297. 297. She's got an Asus. Um, if you go over to Toys R Us, yes, Toys R Us, you can buy a new PC for about $300. If you go to Target, they have them on the end cap of their technology area, of their electronics area, for about $300. Okay? Computers for the masses, for cheap. You can toss it. It's the computer, the laptop, is now disposable. Okay? Um, they're going to bucks. You can't do a whole lot with it. You're not going to do my job on it. You're not going to be doing any video editing. And you're probably not going to be doing any graphic editing. But you know what you can do on it? You can do Microsoft Word. You could do Google Docs. You can get online with it. Most of them have webcams in them, so you can talk to people and make that ubiquitous of interfacing face-to-face. -face. Um, so this has the potential to really even replace e-readers. You know, they, they get better and better. Um, in fact, uh, the ones coming out next year are probably going to be touchscreen. Who would think that you could buy a laptop for 300 bucks with a touchscreen in it? These things are changing. Um, one thing I want to talk about with magazines, though, uh, and there was a reason that I went ahead and handed these out, and I want to make sure I have some of these for you guys, is uh, what's different between a magazine and a website from your perspective? Interactivity. Interactivity? Mm -hmm. Linear versus Star Wars. Linear versus, that's, I don't bet Star Wars, that's a good phrase there. Linear versus starters. So you, you, you're flowing here in the direction that the, the designer let you uh, design the, the magazine, and they're placing the content and the article is where they think they need to go, whereas on a website you just go wherever you want to go, right? You can constantly update the content of the website. Once you publish this, it's fixed. Mm -hmm. I find this interesting because so far we've heard all positives in my mind for websites. What are some positives about the magazine? I can take this anywhere. You can take it anywhere. Okay, this is a very good point. Depending on the magazine, you could have a higher quality photographs or other Higher quality, potentially higher quality. Yeah. Um, depending on the magazine, you're talking about fashion magazines, things of that nature, where there's been a lot of effort into the paper and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> to browse a magazine and read something that I would not have found on a website. It's more immersive. More immersive. Go on with that. Well, on the web, you're more prone to jumping around from link to link to link to link. And if you come across a good article in a magazine, you might just sit on that and read it from start to finish. There are two things that I like about magazines. Okay. Um, first, with this magazine, I got paid to write the article. <laughs> right. This is a good thing to me. Um, I, I write on several blogs. I write on the Leadership Network's blog for digital stuff. I've written in the past for uh, Life Waste Threads blog. I write on my own blog. I write on my digital media blog. I write on the Open Access blog. Right. right. I don't get paid to do this. But when I get an assignment like this, I get paid to do it. Right. Uh, if I'm getting paid to do something, I'm probably going to put a little more effort into it. So I would think that typically you're going to have a little bit better content in the magazines. Um, this is a hope, not an always true, uh, because as you get more and more people uh, moving over to magazines from blogs, perhaps uh, they think of the magazine in the same style that they write for the blog. Uh, I choose to write in a different voice for Collide than I do from the blogs that I'm on. Um, I am. Uh, Maybe unique, maybe not unique, in that the reason I get to write for Clyde, the reason I get to write for Deacon Magazine, the reason that I get to write for Relevant is because they've all found me through my blog. Okay. Um, the other thing uh, that I like about magazines is there's something different between telling people, yes, I write a blog, and yes, I am a published author. Right? Um, there's a bit of pride that goes in there to say, my writing was of the nature and was good enough for someone to spend money to put it in this form. So viewing it from the author's perspective, um, 
I'm a lot more likely to think of someone as an expert once they finally had something hit print. Even though I'm deeply embedded in the digital world, anyone can write a blog. Uh, literally anyone. But it takes at least a little bit of understanding of the English language to be put into an English magazine. Right? On the flip side, uh, I want to talk also about, uh, we don't have a netbook here, but we have an iPhone. right? Um, and one of the reasons that I'm interested in the iPhone here is because uh, one of the great things that the iPhone has done is it has made, uh, you have to have a data plan to have an iPhone. Okay? This greatly increases your monthly bill. Yeah. You have to have a data plan. And so uh, what I found out here is that this iPhone here, if I go into Collide Magazine, you're going to see a nice little article about rural technology. I'm not sure who wrote it, but it's a great article if you want to read it. Uh, and you can read it there on the iPhone. Now that article comes directly out of Collide Magazine. Okay, So there's synergy there. People are paying for this magazine. So clearly, even though the same content is available on the Collide Magazine website, okay, but people are still paying for this, so there is an audience for print pieces. Uh, one of the great things about having this article on here is to say perhaps someone knows me. And so they go to AaronLee.com because that's my blog. And they see on there that Aaron has put up a link that says, hey, the article I wrote for Clyde Magazine is now on the Clyde Magazine website. Right? Well, this becomes marketing for Collide Magazine. Because then people are going to go and they're going to go to the website that are my personal friends. And I'll say, oh, maybe if this magazine is talking about this kind of stuff, maybe I should buy it. And then that becomes a way for the digital content to become marketing for the actual product. Now, not all the content that's in the magazine is on the website. Just maybe the key articles, maybe some of the feature articles show up on the website. Uh, we're handing on the iPhone. Uh, and that's important because the comment was made about the magazine being able to be taken anywhere, right? That's why we like the magazine. Do you guys go anywhere without your cell phones? Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So as the iPhone becomes. <laughs> As the I, did you say yes? I did. Where, where do you go without your, without your cell phone? I only take my cell phone if I am traveling or if there's a babysitter at home. My husband and I share a cell phone. Interesting. Sorry for an anomaly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're unique in this crowd. That's special. Um, so as we, uh, the technology increases, right? Your cell phone, the iPhone, probably one of the most popular phones right here, uh, right now. They all have data plans. They can all get online with it. Um, we were, uh, for those of you who were in the keynote yesterday, uh, the comment was made about that they were trying, Simon Schuster was trying to find a way to uh, make people, let people purchase uh, e-books on their phones. Uh, I would challenge all of you here to say, there's a solution to that. Write an iPhone app. Make the iPhone app free use the iPhone app to then be a gateway to your servers and have them purchase things through the iPhone app. There's enough people with iPhones, enough people that will read on the iPhone. Um, in fact, when I first turned that on, Michael had actually an e-book on it. It was a bunch of text. And I was like, yeah, and this looks good. Books. Do we know what books are? So then there's the Kindle. Okay. This is the Kindle. Uh, Joshua also has one in the back. Uh, Joshua uh, was nice enough to say that we can pass his around, and we'll also pass mine around. Uh, the Kindle is unique in that it is uh, the Amazon Kindle. Okay? Amazon uh, uses this book. Let me get to one here. Uh, this has become my kind of choice way of reading. To be totally honest, the Kindle got me back into reading. I hadn't really read a book for about two years before I got my Kindle. And since I've had this, this is what I read all my books on. Okay? Um, why? Because I don't have to go to the store to buy it, because the prices are cheaper. Um, all of the New York Times bestsellers um, typically are about for the Kindle at $10 each. Um, so that's definitely a reduced price. 
Um, you can go in here. Each Kindle is equipped with a cell phone in it. Uh, you can't make calls on it, but you can get data through it. So you turn the cell phone on and you can go to Amazon.com and you can download uh, through their Amazon One Click. You can download the books immediately. Um, better yet, if the book is on the Kindle service, you can download a preview, which is usually about somewhere between like a fifth and a tenth of the book or whatnot, for free. So you can start reading it, so that this is the book for me or this isn't the book for me, and then with like a button, purchase it. Right. So uh, as I pass this around, you're going to see a bunch on here that say sample, 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 sample. Um, that's because I've downloaded all these as samples. Um, maybe I haven't read them yet, but at some point I thought, man, I want to look into that. And so when I go back through and I have the time, I don't even have to think about, man, i got free time. What book should I read? I'll just scroll through this and see, oh, there's a sample on here. Maybe I want to read that. Read the first chapter or whatnot, and then purchase the rest. Okay. Uh, why is the Kindle the Kindle? Uh, why do we use this, perhaps, instead of a computer screen? The Kindle is designed to be legible. A computer screen is nice and bright, right? It has this huge contrast where it kind of hurts your eyes. Uh, the Kindle, if you look at it, actually uses e-ink. Okay? Um, think of Etch-a-Sketch. It's a high-tech Etch-a-Sketch. Okay. And the contrast is actually very similar to a pencil sketch. Um, and this is the most amazingly easy thing to read. Um, I was out doing a presentation in Florida a month ago, and I was sitting at the swimming pool, reading the Kindle. Didn't bother me at all. Um, I could read it just fine. In the hotel room, I can read it just fine. We'll pass this around, and you'll be able to read it just fine. Uh, this also brings in some of the digital good things about being digital. Uh, I can go in here and I can search. And when I do a search, it'll search through everything I've got on here. If I happen to have a Bible, all I have to do is hit search. Put in whatever verse or whatever topic I'm looking for, and it will pull up the options. Um, it also can search the internet because it's got a cell phone. It also has an HTML browser in it because it's able to show web pages. So this goes with me everywhere. Um, I'll go ahead and pull up on this one. Um, one of the Bibles I've got here. And we can pass this around uh, so you can see uh, what it would look like to read a Bible. So that's the Kindle. Uh, this is potentially where the future for you guys is. Uh, why is that? Because like I said, the Sony e-reader, I don't have confidence in it. It's just a device. This is an entire solution. This is distribution. This is financials. Um, you know, you can upload your stuff to Amazon. It's actually very easy to upload to Amazon. You give them a, a PDF or a Word document. It will automatically change it for you. You'll need someone then to go through and uh, edit the HTML part of it, but it's fairly easy. Um, Brian, should, should I give a, a brief demo on how to move through that? So are you saying, Aaron, that Kendall Jessica managed to mess it up so now. You're fine. The Kindle is... That the Kindle is interactive and the Sony Reader is not, is that basically the difference between the two? No, uh, the Sony e-reader, what you would take, what you would do with the Sony e-reader is you would um, plug it to your computer and you would download from the Sony e-reader store and then it becomes like the iPod where you have to plug into the computer, you use management software, so on and so forth. This guy never gets plugged into the computer. It's got a cell phone connection on it, so it downloads the books directly to it. Um, you can plug it into the computer if you want to purchase things, but not from the not from the Amazon store, and put them in here. But typically, everything is managed on the device, and everything is managed through the data connection hands. Um, there is some issues with the Kindle, and actually, I'm glad that you messed it up, that you got confused with it. Um, one of the issues with the Kindle is the fact that it maybe isn't as user friendly as they want it to be. Um, I see it, and I understand it, and I understand why they did the things the way they did it. Uh, they want you to hold it like you would hold a book. Okay? Um, and so on this side you have, you're holding like a book, you can hit back to go back a page, or the lower button to go next, to go next, for the next page. Um, it also helps when you have the actual holder, then it definitely feels like you're holding a book. Okay? Because you would hold it like this, you know, you've got your hand on the next page, you click it to turn the page. Okay? 
there's lots of buttons down here, right? There's a whole keyboard down here. This is because you can surf the internet and you can have to be able to type in the web pages. I expect that in the future they'll probably come out with a Kindle reader that uh, doesn't have internet connectivity because it will get rid of all this. And so you're just reading books and it makes it simpler. But they tried to do a whole lot of stuff with this. Perhaps that's why it's not totally friendly. So let's go back in here and I will pull up the Bible. This is my list of everything I have. Um, on here, this is not a touch screen. Um, everyone, almost every time that I've handed this to someone, they start touching the screen. Not touch screen yet. Uh, so you have this little guy that is your cursor and also you press it to do things. Um, if you guys, uh, to read this, if you just hit this to the next page and this to go back a page, that'll get you through whatever area of the Bible it is in. So, is this just for Amazon? Do you have to download everything from um, Amazon or can you download from Amazon? Most people are probably going to use this strictly through Amazon, but it actually can read uh, the Moby Pocket books. So if you can download a Moby Pocket book, um, uh, you can use the USB connection to push it out to it. Um, also, uh, there's lots of free books on there. Um, you'll see, if, if, if you were to look through my table of contents, I've got like Alice in Wonderland on there, because the digital Gutenberg project, or whatever it is, has pretty much Josh. You should also mention, uh, you can get newspapers, New York Times, Washington Post, magazines, a lot of magazines are starting to get into it. Yeah. Uh, and there are also, uh, there are also websites like feedbooks.com that allow you to download books on demand If you if you are a person who reads, the Kindle becomes your central device. Just like if you're a person that listens to the music, the iPod becomes your central device. If you guys are interested in pursuing things with the Kindle, uh, the man that was just talking in the back, Josh, uh, uh, has quite the expertise in getting things on the Kindle, and I know that he'd be more than open to talk to you guys. I think one of the brilliant things about the Kindle is actually the Amazon. Uh, the infrastructure uh, that Amazon has created because what it does is it filters out irrelevant content. One of my frustrations with the Sony e-reader device was that they didn't have any way really to sort content, to filter content. So when you looked at content, you saw bestsellers, top 10 titles, but you couldn't, it's really hard to navigate and work through. Amazon does such a brilliant job of filtering out irrelevant content that you probably wouldn't have interest in and sorting it so that you have interest in that, making it accessible to you then and making it really easy to get on and off the device. So I, I've had both of the e-readers, the e and I think you know, the uh, Sony e-reader, the new device, may be a better hard good, maybe easier to interact with, but the, uh, certainly it has a better interface, I would say, than the okay. Kindle, which is a little, I mean, it's been critiqued quite a bit for how unesthetic it is, um, and yet, I think the Sony ebook reader is a little bit more appealing, but I think the back end is much stronger through the Amazon uh, support system they have. So. How many of you here have purchased something from Amazon before? Okay. <laughs> when you purchase something through Amazon, they know that, and they record it, and they attach it to your customer profile. And they are the dramatic, and by far, the leaders of knowing what you want. Right? Okay. The moment that you purchase something, they have to say, okay, you're going to be one of these kinds of people. And if you purchase two things, they say, okay, you're more like this. And once you purchase 50 things, then they say, we know exactly who you are and exactly what you want to read or exactly what you want to view or exactly what kind of weird thing you're going to buy. Okay? And so that translates into your, your Kindle profile. If you've purchased something, uh, if you've purchased uh, an Xbox, right, okay, somewhere in your history, then when you go into your Amazon Kindle, probably it's going to pull up uh, one of the Halo books because they're one of the top selling fiction books right now. And they're connected to the Xbox. So they're going to say, well, you bought an Xbox. I bet you want a Halo book. And it'll show it to you. Um, it's kind of creepy, but, but also <laughs> really cool. Any other questions about the Kindle? Mm -hmm.
it's not as user-friendly or as useful as iPhones. What, what, what he's saying is that, that you don't have to pay a monthly fee for the cell phone connection as a consumer. As a publisher, you guys are the ones paying for that monthly fee. Um, you get 35% of the sale back is all you get. Why is that so low? Because the rest of it goes to pay for delivery to the device. And Aaron, that is negotiable. See, I wasn't even aware of that. Okay, so uh, <laughs> that's negotiable. So for you who are bigger publishers, then uh, maybe you can negotiate. Right, and the 35% is based on the retail price, not the selling price. Like I said before, Amazon decides to discount things at uh, their leisure, like a house being a whole season for $5. Does anyone know what this is? It's a CD from ABBA. Why would I put ABBA, the visitors, on my screen? Am I a huge ABBA fan? Maybe. Probably not. <laughs> uh, perhaps this was the first CD that ever was printed and sold in 1982. Okay. Just a little bit of trivia there that that's the first one ever printed. Um, what's this? It's an iPod Touch. Okay. Uh, the iPhone is pretty much a glorified iPod Touch. So if you've got the iPhone that we're passing around, that's uh, what that's like. If you, uh, Brian, if you want to go ahead and pass out the other iPods that we have, we've got um, an iPod uh, Nano over there, and then an iPod Classic. If you guys uh, have ever seen an iPod, they are incredibly user-friendly as compared to the Kindle. Um, if you, uh, Apple is known for their user-friendliness. This is another part of the, uh, the history of digital distribution. Okay? iPods are ubiquitous with MP3s. Okay? Um, I recently was uh, in China, and Every single MP4 player they have over there uh, is a knockoff of a version of an iPod. They all look like iPods, every single one of them. Um, they're not iPods, but they look like them. Um, there's actually litigation right now because there was a company that, uh, if you remember, uh, a while back, Apple's Shuffle was a Splendor device, um, and other companies came out with the exact same looking thing. And so Apple actually sued them, and that's going to the courts right now. Uh, so when we're talking about music, if you guys have any music, or, you know, I work for Lifeway, so this stuff is all impactful for us because we produce music and video and books, and there's synergy between all of them. Um, if you guys uh, are producing any of those things, you need to know about it. <coughs> if you're not, I would encourage you to think about doing some audio or visual synergy with your book pieces. Because uh, people are becoming, as I said this before, briefly before, people are becoming super fans of products. Um, Heroes. Has anyone here seen the TV show Heroes? Okay. Heroes is one of the most popular TV shows out right now. Um, if you go to Hero, if you go to heroes.nbc.com or whatever the hero site is, uh, they actually produce original content that's what they call any weather shows. They're like a couple minutes long. That's a different story than is actually in the main TV show that you can watch to find out more about your favorite characters or more about the, the world of the heroes. Right? They have comic books that you can download online that's the, the characters from the TV show. Uh, so it's all about making the fans of the show super fans. Um, I'm assuming, would, would you guys know the term evangelical marketing? Not from the evangelical Christian point of view, but evangelical marketing is where companies try to create people that are really involved with the product and let them do the marketing for them, right? So because I like heroes, I go to a conference about digital media, and I mentioned that you should go to the Heroes website to see what they're doing there, right? And so the content there doesn't help them sell anything. What it help, you know, they're not selling this content. It helps them as a marketing tool to make people more fans, deeper fans, so they talk about the product more. I would recommend that you guys think about uh, audio and video pieces. Anyone know what this is? Twister on DVD. DVD. Okay. Twister was the first DVD in 1997. Okay. Uh, Twister has the 
also slightly less exciting uh, notation about it that it was also the last HD DVD ever produced. So it began the DVD era and it pretty much ended the HD DVD era. Uh, and does anyone know what this is? The Xbox 360. Okay. Uh, it used to be that we would purchase movies on DVD, right? And so you own them and you become a collector of these DVDs. The Xbox on November 19th will change and it will introduce Netflix streaming on it. And so if you have a Netflix account and you have an Xbox, you will be able to download and stream, or you'll be able to stream over 10,000 movies for the cost of about $8 a month. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm a super fan, right? See, I like Xbox. I'm uh, so this changes the way that we view movies, right? So what are people going to buy if you can stream the movie? Are they, they going to buy the DVD? There's two reasons now for why you would buy the DVD. One, because you want to put it on your wall, put it on your bookshelf, so that you can show people, I'm this kind of person, and this is what I watch. <laughs> we laugh, but how many of you have bookcases? How many of you show off your books? It's the exact same thing, right? So people will buy DVDs in order to show that they like these things or this kind of person, right? The other reason is they want quality. The stream may be about as good a quality as the DVD, maybe not. Blu-rays, people buy them because it's all about the quality. The streaming is still going to take about three or four years to catch up to Blu-ray quality probably, at which point maybe people will stop buying Blu-rays. Has anyone here heard of Dr. Horrible? Joshua has. Anyone else? Dr. Horrible? Yeah? Okay. okay. Dr. Horrible uh, was a uh, video series, an online video series done by Joss Whedon, who is a director who has a quite a large following um, after having done shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, Dr. Horrible was actually named number 15 in Time Magazine's Top Inventions of 2008. This is the kind of thing that you want to be aware of. Okay? What Dr. Horrible was, was it was a website where you could go and watch the ep three episodes of the Dr. Horrible sing-along blog. Okay? It was a blog and you could go and watch these three episodes for free. Right? For free. He didn't charge anything. Joss Whedon paid out of pocket his own production costs for these, for the, for the, for the shows. Then they turned around and they turned the website off. They said, okay, you watch it, you can't watch it anymore. So what they do? They release the music on iTunes. The only place you could get the music, purchase it legally, for Dr. Horrible, was iTunes. And the album made the top 40 only by being available through iTunes. So he gave something away free that was better quality with the video, right? And then when he turned it off, people went and bought it at iTunes. And now he's going to sell it, release it, probably this Christmas, on DVD with extra features, with actually a whole, it, Dr. Horrible is a musical about a, a guy who wants to join the evil legal people. And uh, they're going to do a commentary on the DVD, and the commentary is all going to be people singing, right? So you've got these extra features, so you created, a he actually went and created a fan base by giving away stuff for free. And then he said, okay, you guys are awesome, you like my work, you like what I did, and I go buy it. And they did. And now they're going to spend, all these people that bought the iTunes songs, I can guarantee you they're going to go out and they're going to buy the DVD. Because there's extra features added. This is why digital distribution becomes so important. You know, uh, I was asking Brian yesterday at the keynote, uh, people are questioning, well, should we put our materials on the Google search where they can see 20% of the book? And I'm thinking, how in the world would you not want to do that? You get into the book, you get a chapter or two, you decide, I like these characters, I like this story, I need to buy the book, right? The only reason that you, in my opinion, the only reason not to put something on something as great and wonderful and digital distribution through Google is if you don't think the book can stand on its own. If the story is good enough, 
that people should want to read it and pay for it, then give them a taste of it. That's my opinion. So there we see that uh, he's not going to release it on DVD. That's the DVD cover. So the questions we have is, why do consumers pay for content? What do you guys think? Why? When, and with the age of Napster having come and passed, with as much free stuff as there is on the internet to take care of your uh, media needs, with Hulu.com being able to stream you movies, not just TV shows, but movies as well, why would people pay for content? Quality. Quality. Definitely quality. Convenience. Convenience. Uh, from my perspective, I see downloading on the internet more convenient than going to Best Buy. But like if somebody wants to watch Office from last week in a hotel room last night, they would pay for that on the television. Right. Last night. Exactly. Actually, that's a great point of view. And actually, that would fall into, into digital distribution. Because really what's happening there is uh, the hotel here has a basically a fancy TiVo that uh, can serve up the videos when you pay for it. Some of the some of the reasons that I would say is uh, collection to have it, just like you guys all have bookshelves of books. Um, uh, Ashley probably is uh, slightly annoyed. She, she she knew this getting into our marriage, um, but. Uh, I am a comic book collector. I read comic books, um, and so if you've ever seen a comic book long box, they're like this big, and they're you know, and so they're filled with comics. And you can fit probably 250 comic books in a long box, right? Um, I'm up to 30 of those, <laughs> and so they take up two walls in my office. Um, I couldn't part with them, right? Because I collect them. They're they're part of who I am, right? Um, how often, do, actually, how often do I go back and, and open those boxes up and read the old comics? <laughs> yes, exactly. I can probably honestly say that I've never opened, since we moved into our new house, I have not opened one of those boxes. Um, but that's okay, because I collect them, right? And so when people pay for content, they're about collecting it. Now, does that mean that they have to buy physical product to be collectors? No. Um, you can buy all kinds of stuff and not have to worry about um, showing it. But other people want to show it, right? Um, if they show it, if, if it goes on your bookshelf because it's, it's a book, it becomes part of your identity, right? I'm a book reader, you know? And you put your favorite, maybe, maybe you set your favorite book on the nightstand when people come over because you want them to see, oh, they read that book. Last night I was in my hotel room on iTunes and there were some folks from this conference who had shared their iTunes library. And so I could see what that means. I, I love the fact that, that you took these to that because I, I, I'll be honest, I wouldn't have guessed that people here would have done that. Uh, I don't know that they intended to do that. Ah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, if, you, if you go to a college campus, most dorm, most, most like dorms, people will, will open up the iTunes <coughs> library and people can discover, oh, my friends are like this, or this guy likes that, I should go talk to him. You know, um, I, when I was in college, uh, eons ago, you know, 2002. Um, when I was in college, uh, people would do that, and I, I knew people that actually met because they uh, liked what they, what the other person used to listen to. And I will offer up that I'll have my computer open in the lunch session, and I have the backyard again if you want to listen. To ah, well, that's <laughs> a little bad. <laughs> um, with Napster, when Napster came out, everyone suddenly realized the importance of intellectual property, right? And discovered that, oh, so when a musician sells a CD, they don't make tons and tons of money like we think they do, right? Uh, so suddenly, we started becoming this Napster, I believe Napster, is what created this movement towards people being super fans. And what I mean by that is, instead of just liking the music for an artist, they want to support the arts. And they will go out and purposely buy the CD because they know that the money that they're using to buy that CD, a portion of it will go to the artist. And they want to support what they're doing. Same thing with books. You know, um, I would never want to steal 
book from someone because I'd be concerned that maybe the author wouldn't get the money. You know, um, th that's the only problem I have with the Kindle is that I know that if I buy a book on the Kindle, then the author is probably not getting as much money. Maybe they are, I don't know all the legal terms, but since, since I know that only 35% goes back to the company, I'm going to guess that the author only gets a portion of that 35%, right? So if the company is making less money off of it, then the author gets less money. So I'm kind of like, ah, maybe I need to buy some books too to support my friends. Um, and then there's also getting the whole product, right? Talk about uh, Dr. Horrible. Uh, people want the extra features. This Christmas, um, obviously I have Xbox 360. I like video games. Um, on the wish list that I have for Christmas, um, there's lots of notifications <coughs> that says, if you buy this game, I want the collector's edition because you get extra stuff. Okay? And this has been a slowly increasing thing that companies would, will do. Is Instead of just selling the game, they sell add-on stuff to it. Okay? There's a game that just came out uh, called Dead Space. And it sold for $60 at the store. But if you went through the company that produced it, you could spend $150 and you got a bunch of extras, like an art book that went with it, um, a DVD for the making of. So people are becoming super fans. Um, in my office, I have the helmet from Halo. Because instead of spending $60 to get the game, I spent $130 to get the helmet with it. <laughs> Why? Because I wanted it. Do you wear the helmet when you play it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only. Don't answer. Yeah. That's, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, and then also the social aspects, right? It's a lot easier to hand someone a magazine and say, hey, look, I wrote an article on this. Take it home with you. And you guys are going to probably have a better chance of actually looking at that article than if I were to say, hey, go to Collide Magazine and look up my article there, right? So it's easier to share stuff sometimes with a physical product. Um, I, I'm all about, you know, giving the books to people to read. Um, Ashley and I have given away so many copies of books to our friends because we think that they need to read them. And it's, there's something different about giving a book to someone than letting them borrow it. And it's a lot. Go ahead. I have a different question. Do you see much future in audio books that you can say download from audible.com on your iPhone? Sure. Uh, I don't think that they're going to get huge compared to audio books on CDs. You know, but I think they'll replace audiobooks on CDs um, in the sense of uh, audiobooks I perceive as a niche market in the first place. Um, so they'll continue to be a niche market, but the distribution of them will definitely change over to, to be digital to be downloaded. Um, we've seen that already with podcasts. Podcasts are just audiobooks. You know? um, in fact, there's been quite a number of podcasts that are just there, there's been a resurgence in radio storytelling mm -hmm. through podcasts because people want to do something different in it. Um, why do customer consumers not pay? Any ideas? Because they find it free? Would you guys pay for something that you could not find free? Yeah. Good. I think some consumers don't pay just because they Perceived inequity. So, yeah. Let me tell you guys right now, DRM is dead. It's dead. And it's dead. Okay? DRM, digital rights management. Controlling how you can use the media is dead. Unless there's a proprietary device that you have to <coughs> use to view it. Perhaps the Kindle. Okay. Uh, the files that you receive on the Kindle are Amazon files, and you're only going to read them on Kindle. Okay. So, but consumers don't view that as DRM. They see it as, okay, we're from the device. Apple set that up for us through the iPod. Um, but now we see that Apple's gotten away from it with the iTunes Plus because the customers just said over and over again, you have to get rid of it. Um, at Lifeway, uh, the products that I work on, the digital media, uh, we don't advertise it, but there's no DRM on them. 
there used to be. And then we took it off because of the number of customer complaints and phone calls. And uh, it's not there anymore. And it hasn't been there for about nine months, but most people don't know that. In fact, Aubrey's writing down some notes, I see. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't advertise it, but it makes it so much easier to distribute. And we get such fewer phone calls. Okay? So for the videos and the audio that I work on, uh, we said, let's try without it. And you know what? We're able to do this crazy thing where when a customer calls, we can say, hey, we trust you. That's new. Customers don't feel that. Uh, when iTunes, Apple struck their deal with the music publishers, mm -hmm. DRM was a requirement. Yes. Amazon struck a deal with music publishers that didn't involve DRM. Steve Jobs went through the roof. Yes. Um, you know, says that that's not fair. Is, is Apple operating under new terms, or are they still uh, required to use DRM on the music from the publisher? Um, when I when I upload con when I upload our content, Blackface content to iTunes, there's a box that I can check that says make it iTunes Plus, which says that these are DRM free. We haven't gone that far yet. Our stuff on iTunes is still DRM, but the, uh, the videos that you can download on flatway.com. So the music publishers may still be distributing their music via iTunes with DRM. Right. But then you see Amazon, who is one of the growing, fastest growing music stores out there, and it's all DRM free. Right. And then they do crazy things like every Friday. You know, again, Amazon, God love them, they're just giving away money. Uh, they, uh, every Friday, they have like, the four or five on Friday, I think is what they call it, something like that, where they take four albums and sell them for $5 each, and they eat the cost because they're marketing their store. Right? So uh, the publisher still gets their full share of it, but Amazon just uses it as a loss later. The same way Best Buy does with Sunday ads. You know, you, you put a DVD on sale, well, that's because they want to, you know, save money. Um, Perhaps media is not worth keeping, perhaps it's too expensive, perhaps they want to stick it to the man. And so they say, I'm not going to buy this stuff because the corporation is too big, they make too much money, so I'm just going to take it free. Or perhaps, just as the social aspects of buying things and giving it, perhaps there's a social aspect of just giving it because they want someone to listen to it. Um, uh, one of my friends emailed me an MP3 on Friday. Did I pay for it? No, he emailed it to me. Did I listen to it? Yeah. Okay, um, I liked it. Am I going to pay for it later? Maybe. You know, if I can figure out where you bought it from. Um, social means sharing, right? Okay. We are moving towards a social culture. So social, I give you a book and I share the book for you with you. Or I send you a, a link to a web page. Or I send you an MP3 on Friday that I want you to listen to. There's a new device that's not quite as popular as the iPod, and this would be called the Microsoft Zoom. The reason I bring this to your attention is because I believe that this is uh, kind of where the future is going a little bit. iPods, you listen to music. With the Zoom, it knows exactly what music I listen to, right? It keeps track of everything. So then when I log into my Zoom software, it says, hey, these people listen to music like you listen to music. Maybe you should listen to some of their music. And instead of having to purchase the music, what I do is I pay for a service. I have a Zoom pass. What this means is I can download all the music I want for $15 a month. And then if I stop using it, then all my, my if I stop paying for it, then it all goes away and I can't listen to it anymore. This, to me, is an acceptable form of DRM. I'm not paying for content. I'm paying for a service. Okay. This is a shift. Um, the reason that it's interesting to me is because of the sharing aspect of it. Right? So all these Zooms, if there was another Zoom in this room, I could look on my device and see that you had a Zoom. And you can see that my Zoom is in the room. And then if there's a song that I want to send you, I can send it from Zoom to Zoom. Or on the software, I can send you a Zoom playlist. I can say, these are the songs I listened to this week. Why don't you download them and listen to them? And if we both have the Zoom pass, because we can listen to all the songs we want. You just download it, right? So we've got to think, what does this mean for the publishing world? Is there a way that instead of selling content, we can begin to think about selling services?
Just an idea. Can I go ahead. Pass around the Zoom? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I gotta speed things up. I got 15 minutes. Yes! Okay, consumers wanted to share their own intellectual property but retain ownership, right? And so they began to think about the thing called Creative Commons. Basically, Creative Commons from God the idea that they, we know now because of Napster that intellectual property is important. So we need to retain our ownership somehow, but I wanna give it to you. Okay, so I create something, but I want you to have it, and I want to stick to the man and not make you pay for it. You get it free from me, but I want to still own it. Okay, this is where Creative Commons comes into play. The Creative Commons approach, uh, recognizing ownership. Okay, I want you to know that I made it. You can have it for free, but if someone likes this song or someone likes this article I wrote, I want them to be able to come back and say, Aaron, that was a great article you wrote on your blog. I found it because of the Creative Commons. That's uh, one, one, one joint in art for our magazine. Okay? So I want to recognize ownership. I want to be able to communicate my desires. Right? If I give it to you free, I want you to know that I want you to give it free. If I give it to you free, I want you to know that you can't sell it. If I give it to you free, perhaps I want you to know that you can sell it. Just put my name on it. Or you can change it. Just put my name on it. Right? Communicating the rights, you know, what are my rights? Uh, and giving back to the community. Perhaps someone out there releases some music that I want them to be able to, uh, uh, that, that they say you can use this. And so I use a beat or a track or um, maybe some spoken word type stuff and then I make something new out of it so that I can give back to the community. Those are some of the ideas that came behind the Creative Commons approach. Creative Commons is basically, uh, it was founded by Lawrence Lessig. And basically, the whole point of Creative Commons was to do all the legal work for the regular person. So when you put something under a Creative Commons license via creativecommons.org, you can go in and attribute certain things to it. You have four different things you can do to it, and we'll, and we'll look at those in a minute. Uh, has it, is it, does it work legally? Well, we're still figuring that out. Okay? The only real case that's happened so far is that uh, Adam Curry, do you remember him from MTV News? Yeah. He's a podcaster. Uh, he took some photos, he put them on Flickr, and there was a Dutch tabloid magazine that then used his Flickr photos that were licensed under Creative Commons, and they put them in the magazine. Well, his license under Creative Commons said that you couldn't use his photos for commercial use. You can't make money off of them. You can use them on your website, or you can use them for your personal use or in a presentation, but you can't sell them. So the tabloid sold the tabloid. They made money off of his photos, so he took it to the courts. And the Dutch courts said, OK, you can't do this. You know? And so Adam Curry actually was trying just to prove a point, and so he didn't even say, I need money. He just said, that they have to agree to legally not do that again in Creative Commons. If it's if it's not if it's non-commercial, they have to adhere to the non-commercial license. So the first one we'll look at is attribution. Okay. The question is, which is more important, the content or the creator? Here I have some photos, and these are all fancy photos. Well, look at they're pretty, right? Okay. And so I put these pretty photos in my presentation. And I could say, hey, look at these pretty photos, and look how pretty my presentation is. Right? Perhaps you guys think these are pretty photos. Right? And so you want to uh, talk to me about the photos. Well, what's more important, the photos and just seeing them, or knowing who did the photos, so you could then go talk to him and have him do photos for you. Perhaps you want to talk to Thomas Hawk. He took the photos. And look them up on Flickr. They're out there. And these are all, all three of these photos are Creative Commons licensed. Um, if you want photos that are free to use, so long as, uh, depending on the attribution, depending on whether or not you want to use them commercially, you can go to flickr.com slash Creative Commons. And people will, when they upload photos to Flickr, they might put a Creative Commons license on them for you to use. Non-commercial, what does that mean? You can't sell it. Right? What good is that? 
Well, we can use free to make a conversion, okay? Non-commercial license allows us to use content in order to almost market it. Us as publishers, why would we want to do this? It's marketing, okay? This right here, uh, you can't really read that at all. That is the Beth Moore blog, okay? And earlier this summer, Beth Moore decided that she was going to go through a study, a Bible study, with some other readers of her blog. And so she talked about it on her blog, okay? This would be a way that we take free to content. She was putting, she puts up posts about the study that they were going through um, to help the ladies go through the study. Well, you'll see right here that this says, uh, hey ladies, we've gotten word that some of you are having a difficult time finding the workbooks. I came in one day to work and Lifeway was sold out. All of Lifeway was sold out of the workbook. Because Beth Moore said, hey, let's do a study online. And so I'll go through it together. And so there was a great panic in our office because we were like, whoa, what do we do? <laughs> you know? uh, so this free online blog going through the study led to real conversions to the point that we didn't have any in stock and we had to rush print more. Okay? Free can turn into money. Uh, next year, you guys are going to see a book come out that's called Free. Buy it when you see it in the stores because it is going to change the publishing world. Derivative works. Okay, This is uh, all about building a relationship between the consumer and the content. Derivative works is if I give you something, you can make changes to it, you can make something new out of it. Why would the customer want to do that? It builds the relationship between the customer and the content. I'm sure you don't know what this is. This is actually a portion of the Nine Inch Nails website. Okay. Uh, uh, and this is the greater portion. If you guys know who Nine Inch Nails is, you're probably surprised that we're talking about them at the ECPA. Uh, okay. There's a reason we're talking about them. Nine Inch Nails puts the portions, the, the stems of their tracks, which is like the different audio portions of the different parts of the track, you can download some of their songs and remix them. And then what this right here, the, the, the one left is that's all black and evil. Um, <laughs> this is what people have uploaded back to the Nine Inch Nails website. And then other of their customers go in there and they rate the songs or they download the songs. So the customer has built a relationship with this content. This is all free so far, right? So what's the point? It's just about, you know, how's the company making money, okay? Well, after he did this, they came out with um, a series of albums called Ghosts 1 through 4. So basically, uh, Trent Reznor released four albums at the same time. And the way he released them was, you could download the entire first album for free. The whole thing, for free, the whole album for free. Or you could do a $5 for all the albums. Or you could spend $10 and he would mail you a double CD set. So you've got all these tracks on two CDs. Or instead of spending $10 for the CD set, you could spend $75 for the deluxe edition set. Or you could spend $300 and get the Ultra Deluxe Limited Edition Package, $300. And you know what? He made 2,500 of those $300 CD sets. And in three days, he sold out of all of them, making $750,000. Content that was free, or to give a premium for $300, sold out of 750,000 views. Because Trent Reznor had created a relationship his customers. Clear and simple. After this, he came out with an album called The Slip. And The Slip was entirely given through Creative Commons with the attribution non-commercial share alike license. Okay? What this meant was if you downloaded it, you had if you gave it to someone else, you had to tell them that it was nine inch nails. Okay? It was non-commercial, which meant that you couldn't sell it, and it was share alike which means if you did something to it, and you were allowed to do something with it, if you did something with it, you had to share it too. You couldn't just change it and then charge for it. 
he had over 1.4 million downloads of that album. Okay, so he's creating that relationship, and I guarantee you, the next time he releases an album, those fans are going to purchase it again. How do customer consumers interact with content? They share it. They come. They form a relationship with it. They share it through the Zoom. How do consumers interact with technology? This is a great question. The more important question is, what is technology? If they're going to interact with it, what is it? Okay. What would you guys define as technology? Hardware, the software. Hardware, software. The cultural definition of technology is going to be something that you remember being invented. So something that you remember not existing. Okay. Um, I wouldn't call this technology. Okay. This is an iPod. Does this look old to you? It looks old to me. This is an iPod Mini. This came out um, several years ago, uh, and it can barely do what any of the iPods can do nowadays. Right? You show this to a little kid, they're going to tell you that's not technology. That's old. Okay. Um, took a look at this list right here. In 1982, CDs came out. In 1989, the Game Boy was out. 1997, DVDs came out, and the first HD TV broadcast happened in the United States. In 99, Napster. 2001, the iPod. Last year, the Kindle. What this means is that CDs have been out for 26 years. So if you're younger than 26 years old, which good portion of your customers are, CDs, not technology whatsoever. Game Boy, if you're under 19 years old, not technology. Does Game Boy have relevance to you guys? Yes, no, maybe? No? This is a Game Boy, right here, okay? I recently went to China, so I bought my Chinese coach. This is a software application, not a game, that teaches you how to speak Chinese. Am I great at Chinese? Heck no. Can I speak Chinese? Not really. But the point of it is to teach you. In Japan, where Game Boy is even more ubiquitous than here, they sell storybooks on Game Boy. The Game Boy is about to do, uh, they're about to come out with a new DS that connects with the internet fully, and on that, they're going to have downloadable content. I guarantee you someone is going to find a way to put children books on the DS at a cheap, low cost. Does DS affect you guys? It's not even technology anymore. DVDs, 11 years. HDTV, 11 years. Your kids are not going to think of these as technology. Napster, we've been sharing files for nine years. We haven't figured it out yet. For me, Napster is not technology. Sharing stuff, not technology. My job is all about getting files to other people, right? iPod, seven years. I see kids, six, five years old, with iPods. Um, I, was, I met with a guy, I had lunch with a, a video producer um, a couple weeks ago, and he had his iPhone out, and he, was, he had a picture of his daughter playing with other devices that he had. His daughter was playing and knew how to operate. His four-year-old daughter was playing and knew how to operate an HD camcorder. She knew how to use the iPhone. Okay? This stuff isn't technology. At least it definitely won't be in 10 years. So this is why we need to grapple with this. And the Kindle, well, we've only got one year on it. So we've got a little bit of time there to figure that out. The transmedia question. Transmedia, across all medias, do you let the consumer play with your property? This is the big, old question. I don't know. That's a new change. But I can tell you what, Microsoft lets them. Uh, from the Microsoft website on video games, here's the magic word from our lawyers. That's what they actually say. So long as you respect these rules, Microsoft grants you a personal, non-exclusive, non-transferable license to use and display game content to create derivative works based on the game content strictly for non-commercial and personal use. That sure sounds like Creative Commons. 
Okay? They're not officially using Creative Commons, but it's the exact same idea. What they're saying is that you can take images from any Microsoft game, including Halo, or including Vita Piano, or whatever other game that you want that Microsoft publishes, you can take images from it, and you can use them at anything non-commercial. They're okay with it. They're not going to sue you. They're not going to be upset with you. You can do whatever you want with their content, as long as you don't sell it. Spore is a game that just came out. It's already sold over a million copies. Uh, Spore is a game where you create the creatures in it. Okay. So now, instead of just sharing the content and letting your people do whatever they want with the content, e Electronic Arts is letting people create the content for their product. So they release this board game, they have some creatures in it that come in the disc, but then they said, okay, everyone make, make creatures to fill up our universe, right? And so they released the creature creator before the game ever came out, and they charged $10 for this disc for people to be able to make creatures. Okay. So you didn't even get the game. You spent ten dollars and you made stuff, right? They were expecting a hundred thousand in three months. That's what they wanted. They wanted a hundred thousand creatures created in three months from their customers. In less than one month, the customers created one point eight billion creatures. Okay. There's only one point five billion creatures that we've cataloged on Earth. Which led the producer of the game's war to say that the electronic arts customers are more powerful than God. Okay? So, uh, whereas we're struggling with the question, do we let our customers play with the content, the people that are paving the way for us are saying, let's let the customers make the content. The future needs your content too. Uh, this is kind of fun for me, this is kind of what I also study, uh, Surface Computing. This is coming, okay? This is right away. Have you guys seen the Surface, the Microsoft Surface table? Have you seen on CNN where they have the big map that they touch and things change, okay? Uh, Microsoft recently had a survey out asking people, if we put this technology where you have a table with a touch screen on it, that's like a coffee table size, would you buy it? Would you buy it? Would you pay fifteen hundred dollars for it? More than likely, by twenty ten, there'll be a home version that'll be about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars, the cost of a high end computer now that you could have for your home. This kind of stuff needs applications. They've already released the development kit for this kind of stuff to happen. Does this affect you? I don't know. Does coffee shops do they have tables? Do you think they might buy some of these? Might they need content? Touchscreen is going to be standard. Windows 7. They've said Windows 7 comes out 2010, but if you read any of the technology blogs, they're saying it comes out next year. Why do we say that? Well, because EPCs, the little, le the little netbooks I told you about in the very beginning, those next year are all having a hard drive to come out with touchscreens on them. And more than likely, uh, Windows 7 is going to come standard on them because Microsoft has made the pitch to make Windows 7 very, very nicely work with low-end computers. Touchscreens are going to be standard in probably about a year and a half. Mobile books. The picture you're seeing there is not a fluke. It is not a design. It is actually real. What you see in that picture is a guy holding a piece of paper that is a screen, that is flexible, and that is currently already real and in production just hasn't met mass market yet. So as cool as the Kindle is, we're going to get cooler stuff really quick. And virtual worlds. Perhaps you've heard of Second Life. Um, Second Life is what I would call a failure. People put a lot of money into it. People would buy islands on it. And uh, maybe there'd be a couple thousand people that would visit the marketing aspect of it. But we see right there, this is Sony's PlayStation Home. Later this year, every single owner of a PS3 will have PlayStation Home installed on their machine. It's a great marketing opportunity, and Sony is desperate for content right now. I don't know how reading fits into the PS3, but I can tell you right now that, like I said, there's uh, Fallout 3 is a video game that comes out. Um, it's already out, and it has over 100,000 words in the game that people can read. So video gamers are willing to read. 
maybe someone could come up with a library to be in Second Life, or to be in Sony's home. Future-proofing your content. Things to think about. Content first. Okay? You've got to develop the content as content. As content. Okay? This is what we're working on right now at LifeWay, is figuring out how to work just content first, and then work on the product. Content's going to be separated from product. Okay? Because if you have the content, just the content, and the product is secondary, you can do things like put it on Amazon Kindle with very much ease. <coughs> Storage needs. The hard drives are cheap nowadays, but in order to get real good hard drives that are production quality with backups and whatnot, you need to be prepared to spend money. And as things go digital, you need to have the storage being scheduled. <coughs> and figure out how are your consumers using content. This is the most important. If they're not, they're, they're going to use your content in some way, shape, or form. Creating new content, look at tech job postings. I love my job. I have a very great job, but I have no intention of leaving it. But I read tech jobs every day. I see what Microsoft is doing every day, because that tells you where the future's going. What are the futures? Um, my other master's degree that I was going to talk a little bit about, but we didn't get to it, um, is studies of the future. And in this, we talk about trying to figure out two or three scenarios as to what the future might be. So don't tell yourself this is what the future's going to be. Figure out what might it be. I figure out two or three scenarios and figure out how to accomplish them that way. And then what are your kids talking about? They're going to know better than you will. I'm excited to have kids in the future because they're going to tell me what you know. Uh, if they're playing with an iPod already, iPods are ubiquitous. If they're talking about gaming, figure out what they're actually talking about. They're talking about social or graphics or what it is that is the future. And I think we have time for about one minute of Q&A. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.